In my previous video, I introduced Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. I performed a little home experiment, covered some theory and also used a few examples to show you how the uncertainty principle works in real life. However, I am sure many of you were left wondering, but where does the uncertainty principle come from? How does it arise? In this video, I'll discuss in some detail the way in which the uncertainty principle and wave-particle duality are intimately related, and how uncertainty naturally arises out of the indeterminacy which is inherent in wave-like systems. It's a fascinating topic. I hope you enjoy it. We know that both light and matter exhibit what is known as wave-particle duality. Under different circumstances, both light and matter can display either type of behavior, wave-like or particle-like. Depending on how we set up our experiment, the types of questions we decide to ask nature and whether or not we make an observation. Let's take an electron for instance. How can we possibly describe such an entity? We know that it acts like a particle whenever we look at it. However, when we don't look, it acts like a wave. And since an unmeasured electron acts differently than a measured one, it appears we simply cannot describe it without referring to the act of measurement. Which brings me to the question of whether it is meaningful at all to ask if something like an electron does exist in and of itself, as a particle or as a wave. Is an electron a wave? Is it a particle? Is it both? Is it either one or the other but never both at the same time? Could it be that the reason these questions are so difficult to answer is that it may be meaningless to talk about the notion of reality itself, or about the independent existence of objects in any sort of absolute sense? Perhaps all we can talk about is our own perceptual interfaces, our own conceptual constructs, and our own mathematical models of the world. As Werner Heisenberg himself very wisely said, what we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. And of course, this inevitably brings me to physicist Niels Bohr, Heisenberg's fatherly friend and mentor. Bohr developed a philosophical view which he termed complementarity. I'll cover this topic in detail in my next video, but for now, it suffices to say that what Bohr pointed out was the fact that the properties of a quantum system seem to be completely dependent on what the observer chooses to measure. In this way, the questions we ask and our choice of experimental setup determine what sorts of properties the system will manifest and what sort of features it will exhibit, and this certainly includes its wave-like and particle-like behavior. So, yes, wave-particle duality is a type of complementarity. How much wave-like or particle-like we observe a system to behave depends entirely on our mode of questioning. What we ask, how we ask it, and whether we make a measurement or not does matter. In fact, Bohr actually denied that it is even meaningful to talk about the nature of a system per se that is, to talk about its properties in themselves independently of them being observed. Here we're talking not about a reality in itself, but about a deeply contextualistic reality, a reality which manifests differently in complementary ways depending on the questions we ask, a reality which is inseparable from our instruments of observation and our modes of questioning. And yet, despite the possible meaninglessness in asking some of these questions, or perhaps I should say thanks to the fact that Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg found it meaningful to discuss these profound ontological and epistemological questions, they came up with their complementary and uncertainty principles. And it is because of these principles, amongst many other important contributions, that Bohr and Heisenberg became two of the main founders of an incredibly precise mathematical theory, which, believe it or not, successfully combines the particle-like and the wave-like features we observe in the world. Two complementary descriptions of reality beautifully merged into one single theory. Yes, I am talking about quantum mechanics, the most precisely tested theory in the history of science, a mathematical model which predicts the way the world manifests as we make observations. 
In other words, a theory not predictive of events, but predictive of observations, a theory which incorporates the concepts of energy quantization, complementarity, wave particle duality, the uncertainty principle, and the correspondence principle. Okay, so let's start this section by talking about waves. Ask yourself this question, where is a wave? Where in space-time is a wave located exactly? Imagine we have a completely uniform wave stretching out to infinity in all directions. What is the wave's exact position? Is it here or is it there? Is it everywhere or is it nowhere? It is obvious that, in this situation, the question of where, that is, asking about the wave's exact position, makes no sense at all. On the other hand, it is clear that it still makes perfect sense to ask how fast and in which direction the wave is moving. In other words, to ask at which velocity the wave is propagating. Now, let's imagine that the type of wave we're dealing with is a probability wave. Not a physical, tangible wave that can be perceived or measured, but a wave that represents a world of possibility. A wave that describes how likely we are to observe any given particular value of a property of the system under study, such as its position, for instance, should we decide to make a measurement. To illustrate how this works, by using this type of wave, we make the rule that the probability of measuring the electron in a certain position let's say here, is proportional to the square of the wave's amplitude at that position. So, applying this rule to this particular example, we can see that the probability of finding the electron over here is higher than the probability of finding the electron over there, since the amplitude of the wave is larger here than it is over there. Okay, so it turns out that the wave I described earlier on, remember, the completely uniform wave stretching out to infinity, that wave is actually the simplest kind of probability wave, and it can be used to describe a particle which has no forces acting on it. Yes, we're talking about a free particle. How is that so, you may wonder? Well, when no forces at all act on a particle, the particle's velocity, and therefore its momentum, is always constant, very well defined at all times. The essence of wave-particle duality is the recognition that all particles of matter or light also exhibit wave-like behaviour, and so any given momentum can always be directly associated with a particular wavelength. In this case, applying de Broglie's formula to the free electron, we can see that a constant momentum implies a constant wavelength. And what does a constant wavelength mean? It means we have a uniform wave that goes on indefinitely. So, we now have a wave that can be successfully used to describe our free electron. Through the wave's wavelength, we can know the particle's momentum. However, here's the problem. What about the electron's position then? If this kind of wave describes a free particle with a very well-defined momentum, where is the particle located then? It's easy to see now that a uniform wave with such well-known wavelength doesn't really help us describe a particle that is more likely to be located in one place than another. In other words, as soon as we have absolute knowledge of the particle's momentum, asking where the particle may be found ceases to be a meaningful question. It's just meaningless. There ceases to be a where in this case. Asking about the particle's position makes no sense because the wave is spread out over all space. We can see, therefore, that this wave doesn't actually make a good model if we want to describe a particle that is more likely to be found in a particular location than another. It is clear that what we need is a varying amplitude, amongst other changes. So, what can we do then? Well, what we need to do now is find a different wave-based description of the particle which also allows us to specify, at least to some degree of accuracy, the position we're likely to find the particle should we decide to make a measurement at any given time. The answer to this problem is something called a travelling wave packet. And what does a travelling wave packet look like? Well, in one dimension, let's take the x-direction for instance, we're talking about a short burst of waves that moves along the x-axis. The amplitude of this burst of waves is large only in the region of the wave packet, and it falls off rapidly on either side. 
since the probability of finding the particle at a particular location is proportional to the square of the amplitude, the particle is in this case likely to be found only in the region of the wave packet. This solves our problem. There is still a degree of fuzziness as to the question of where the particle may be found, but at least we have made some progress. Ok, so how do we build a wave packet then? Well, a wave packet can be built up by adding together a series of infinitely long wave trains whose wavelengths lie within a finite range of values. The mathematical ideas that underlie this technique were developed by French mathematician Jean-Baptiste Fourier and the technique is known as Fourier synthesis. In simple terms, a wave packet can be constructed from an infinite set of sinusoidal waves of different wavelengths, with phases and amplitudes such that they interfere constructively only over a small region of space and destructively elsewhere. Adding a continuous distribution of waves of different wavelengths together produces an interference pattern, which begins to localize the wave. We've created a wave packet. The wave packet model allows us to take into account the wave-like properties of the particle. But the important point to notice here is that, because the model also allows us to give a more or less localized description within space-time, it now also helps us to take into account its particle-like features, such as position in this case. We have therefore constructed a model which has at its heart the wave-particle duality we wanted to describe. Perfect. Now, quantum mechanics describes the state of a system, whether this system is an electron, a photon or something else, using probability functions similar to the wave packets we have just described. And it is precisely from the very principles underlying this probabilistic description that aims to reconcile the particle-like and wave-like properties in nature that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle comes from. Here's how. As we have just seen, if we want to describe the conceptual idea of a free particle with a well-known momentum, then we have to use a wave that is infinitely long and uniform everywhere, which in turn makes it impossible to state where the particle might be found at any given time. The concept of where becomes meaningless in this case. So, although we know the particle's momentum with absolute precision, we find that we can no longer even ask where the particle may be found. We have also seen that it is possible to describe the particle using a wave packet. In this case, the particle is fairly localized in space, so its position can be more or less defined. But since the wave packet's building blocks are a number of waves, each of them having a different wavelength, this results in the momentum of the particle now being quite poorly defined. In other words, since each wave we have used as a building block for the wave packet has a different wavelength, the momentum's uncertainty is now quite large. It seems that the more we manage to localize the wave packet in space, the more uncertainty we find in the particle's momentum, and vice versa. A rigorous mathematical derivation of these facts results in Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, where the uncertainty in position, delta x, is approximately the width of the wave packet, and delta p is the uncertainty in momentum. The uncertainty principle requires that a narrow spread in one of these quantities is offset by a wide spread in the other. There's always a trade-off in how well-defined these two variables can be at any given time. For instance, if delta x is small, it follows that delta p is large, at least as large as h bar over 2 delta x. So now you know how Heisenberg's uncertainty principle arises. Contrary to popular belief, the uncertainty principle is not the result of measurement disturbances, but it lies at the heart of quantum mechanics. Because quantum mechanics is the way we mathematically model the indeterminacy, the wave-particle duality and the quantization we encounter in nature. The uncertainty principle is a result which can be derived theoretically from the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics, principles which describe an inherent indeterminacy and a trade-off in the relationship between certain pairs of variables or properties. In physics, these pairs of properties are called complementary or conjugate observables. Which brings me back to the concept of complementarity. 
In my next video, I'll cover Bohr's principle of complementarity in much more detail. We'll talk about complementary observables and how all of these ideas relate to the uncertainty principle and its derivation. I'll also show you other forms of the uncertainty principle which involve other pairs of observables such as energy and duration. I really hope you're enjoying this series. Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe. And if you're willing to help me financially, here are the links to my Patreon account and PayPal donation page. Thank you for watching and thank you so much for your support. See you in the next video.